Hi, I'm Tim Zacharias with Cougar USA and your host of Building Value. I have two wonderful guests today. Very excited to have Jonathan Hamp Adams, Grumfoss America's Regional Vice President of Water Utility and Groundwater, as well as Paula Pasharek, City of Houston Public Works Conservation Division Manager. So thank you all and welcome to the show. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Yes, it's a pleasure to be here. Awesome. Thank you, Tim. It's fantastic to be here and uh, looking forward to the conversation. Awesome. Awesome. Well, very excited about today's episode. Like I said, we're going to be talking about the global water crisis and an opportunity to kind of think globally, act locally here in the city of Houston with Walk for Water. On Building Value, we go behind the scenes of building operations to showcase the people and products that make buildings work and the value they bring to the community. Paula, can you tell me about where you grew up? Yeah, I grew up in Argentina, in Buenos Aires, uh, many months ago. Um, and, um, and, and yeah, it's, it's a, that's my, my hometown. So I'm, I'm Awesome. Well, how'd you end up here in Houston then? Well, long story, you know, <laughs> my family essentially brought me here and, and we moved in 2001. Uh, we went to Kentucky, Louisville. Okay. That where I lived there for 10 years. And then in 2012, I moved to, in, to Houston, and it, it ha this has been my hometown ever since. So awesome. I, I really love it here. So yeah. it's very diverse. Yes, absolutely. I mean, mm -hmm. you can find food and people from almost anywhere here. Oh, Houston. yes, yes. And, 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 and people from all over the world are very much, you know, you feel part of the community. Mm -hmm. So um, Absolutely. That diversity helps a whole lot when you're not from here. Yes, so. and we have another, <coughs> hu you know, transplant here to uh, the city of Houston with with Jonathan. Can you give us your background? Yeah, so I come from the deep south. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> nice, uh, South Africa. Yes, uh, I was born in a small town called Stellenbosch, which is uh, in the kind of Napa Valley of South Africa. Okay. Um, I was born on a wine farm, or at least I was made on a wine farm. <laughs> I think I was born in a hospital. <laughs> um, <laughs> that my mother told me. Um, Those are the uh, consequences. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, uh, <laughs> I was, pr I was made in the in uh, out outside vet number six, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I grew up on the East Cape of South Africa and uh, relocated to Johannesburg in 2000 and then to the United States in 2015. Awesome. Yeah. And I guess, you know, through that process, you've been with Grumfoss in that move from uh, South Africa to here to the U.S., correct? That's right. I've been with Grumfoss for just under 15 years, but selling Grumfoss product uh, through distribution, so probably just over 20 years of uh some kind of relationship, if you want, with with Grundfos nice. uh, as a product, and Grundfos relocated me from uh, from South Africa to USA in yeah in 2015. Nice. And and what is your role now? Um, I'm responsible for uh, water utility sales in North and South America. Uh, that's including uh, municipal wastewater and water supply, water treatment, and groundwater awesome. and irrigation. Awesome. Very relevant for our conversation today. Um, uh, so, Paul, I'd like to hear a little bit more about how you got into kind of that water conservation role. It seems to be something you have a passion for, been doing uh, for a little while and now for the city of Houston. Yeah, absolutely. So it was it's, it's, it was a journey. It's, it's something that it didn't happen certainly overnight. Uh, I uh, did many careers before, so I did marketing, I did psychology, and I was at the end of my undergrad degree, and we, you're starting to choose. Uh, and you know, you, you attend a class that you love. For me, it was geography, and I, was, I loved it, and that kind of changed my, my course of action. And you know, I was very definitely very much in, into the environment and protecting the environment, but I still didn't know what I wanted to do until later on in my grad, in grad school. And, uh, you know, I started, you know, like, like any student, you start preparing your research uh, paper and you have to choose and you're pretty much forced into choosing. Mm -hmm. And so at that point, I started reading a lot about water and water conflicts around the world. And, you know, you start, you know, uh, learning, mm -hmm. learning about different literatures, different issues around water. And so 
finally, I was doing all of that, and on top of everything, I had a little bit of an epiphany, um, believe it or not, and that's what kind of gave me this, this very strong feeling that this is the path that I needed to take, which was um, I had an epiphany about my um, hometown of Buenos Aires mm -hmm. being in a drought, in a very severe drought. So it was the, the landscape, it was, this is, was a city, you know, completely full of dust, people like, you know, looking for water, I exchanging bottles of water. So that was a the, the scene that I woke up one day to, mm. and kind of that made it for me. And so I was very fortunate that when I moved to Houston, right after I finished my grad school, is that I got a job in conservation. Um, and then I've been in, you know, uh, in different, I, I, I changed uh, uh, companies or, or organizations, and then I've been also in conservation roles. And finally, I wanted to work at the city because I knew that I could make the most impact mm -hmm. from the city. So that was kind of my long-term goal. And, and here I am, uh, you know, in a water conservation role, um, you know, overseeing all the conservation programs, but also some water loss initiatives and Later on, we'll chat more <laughs> about some of yeah. those initiatives. Yeah, that's very cool. I mean, I, you know, I think uh, some people, unfortunately, are living that epiphany right now, right? I mean, we've had severe drought in a lot of places um, yeah. this year. And, and so I think that probably hits home for a lot of people. And, you know, we're very fortunate in the city of Houston and a lot of other places to be able to go and just turn water on and, and you know, get good, clean tap water. Um, and that's not necessarily the case for everybody. But, you know, how, how does the city of Houston supply water to this massive amount of not just you know residential homes but also commercial buildings and the the massive industrial kind of complex that we have yeah uh so well the city has uh, a lot of water rights you know see very senior water rights that acquired a long long time ago so they're they're very um they're very stable and safe in a way so that's a great thing to have and it has not developed all the water rights. That means that we have additional water rights to be developed. And the, the way that we develop water rights is actually building water plants. And those water plants have a certain capacity mm -hmm. to treat water. Uh, the city right now has three water plants and they have in, in combined, they have a capacity of approximately 600 million gallons per day. Uh, we produce, yes, <laughs> we, we produce, uh, on average, we, we pump 450 million gallons a day. Right now, you know, during peak times, we are in at 540 million gallons a day. And we take that water, we, we, uh, we take that water from our lakes, mainly surface water. We have three lakes, mm -hmm. Lake Houston, uh, Lake Livingston, and Lake Conroe. And, um, and then 87% 80 of our tap water is from those lakes. And the remainder, which is 13%, 15%, comes from groundwater sources. Right. Yeah, that's incredible. And, you know, I think it's definitely something that people take for granted. I mean, we've had a couple of interruptions in the city of Houston over the last, say, two years that have been uh, kind of outliers. You know, one was the, one of the main breaks going to the city or da to downtown. And then during the freeze, there were some interruptions mm -hmm. in, in operations. But outside of that, I mean, it's a very you know, stable water system for how large it is. Um, so pretty incredible that all of that is coming from those three lakes. And for the majority of it, it sounds like it's pumped um throughout the city and not necessarily using water towers to by gravity provide pressure yeah we, we don't necessarily use uh towers for this this is all like uh, pressure mains and mm -hmm. so uh and we have a, something i think of highlight from for the city is that we have more than seven thousand miles of distribution that's lines which to give you an idea that's the distance from uh, the city of Houston to New Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> so when you have to maintain yeah. uh, that amount of, uh, you know, lines, uh, it could be quite, uh, you know, under undertaken. So, and we, we're going to be talking about that later. But yes, that's that's one of we're, we're very proud to be to be you know responsible for that. Mm -hmm. But it's a huge responsibility at the same time. Absolutely, and so I mean I think that's a good kind of segue to for Jonathan to jump in and and you know maybe talk a little bit about how what role Grumpfus plays in that uh, distribution of, of water kind of at that broader level I mean we're very familiar obviously with what Grumpfus does inside the buildings and pressure boosting and circulating but you know what's Grumpfus's role kind of in the broader distribution of, of water yeah I think uh, and, and and as you well know we uh, we like to consider ourselves a bit of the world champions when it comes to distribution or boosting 
and uh, that th that has translated across from commercial buildings into the utility space, uh, managing pressure, mm -hmm. uh, and and r really moving water from outside, at least outside the fence, uh, to um, homesteads around around the world, or at least in the city of Houston. Uh, we also have a role to obviously play on the disinfection side. Um, Grundfos has a long history through our acquisition a number of years ago of the Aldos company in Germany where we do the, the chemical treatment and of course uh, 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 chlorine treatment of, of the water as well. So right now uh, we do of course have the, p the, the, the pumps that are moving large volumes of water from intake um, to into the water treatment plant but it's a distribution where, mm -hmm. where I think Grundfos really is a is a champion uh, uh, in terms of our product portfolio and our capability. And then of course here in the city of Houston, uh, at our plant, we, we build our customized uh, um, booster systems mm -hmm. which are, are sent all over the United States uh, uh, for utility uh, plants that are, or from utility plants to, to for the cities. Absolutely, and then also plays a role in their, the uh, sump pumps are made in, in Brookshire as well, but you know, you look at that kind of whole water cycle and you look at after the points of use and now going to the wastewater treatment plants, Grumpus is playing a role in that, that side as well, correct? Yeah, we've, you know, for a long time, uh, and when I say a long time, more than 20 years, uh, we, we've, we've had a, pl a role to play throughout the water cycle from, mm -hmm. from intake uh, to the through, uh, as I said, water treatment, distribution. Um, I was w in a in a conference this week, and they were talking before the toilet and after the toilet. I think is the, <laughs> the way to describe it. So, so okay. we have roles. We okay. ha we, we've had a role to play uh, before the the, uh, the the toilet and after, and after, of course, then it's uh, what we call collections, mm -hmm. and uh, then pumping it through to the wastewater treatment plant. Once again, uh, you. you we you'll find our products in 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 the wastewater treatment plant again moving the waste uh, and then of course treating it before the water ends ends up back into the cycle mm -hmm. uh, normally uh, well at least in the city of Houston it it'll ends up back in the rivers yeah it's a you know if you look up the the kind of the energy water nexus or water gene nexus it's it's very interesting how interdependent water and energy are through that whole uh, process of kind of a little side you know, rabbit hole if anybody wants to go down there, but some really cool uh, stuff if you if you do some searching on, on that. Oh, uh, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. And virtual water, too. You know, the water that mm -hmm. is embedded in everything that we consume nowadays has, you know, a footprint of, of water. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's that's very interesting. And, and there's a lot of countries, for example, that the countries such as um, Israel, right, all in the Middle East, that they don't have uh, water that they desalinate, for example, right. they actually import a lot of goods because it's 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 cheaper for them because right. they don't have the the water to to produce those products. So again, that that is the is uh, the concept of virtual water that I think is fascinating that uh, we perhaps don't talk about too much today. But for countries that are really scarce, that's a, a at the top of their. Mm -hmm their list in terms of, you know, what, what is it that they need to buy and, and um, not produce internally so that they could save water. Interesting. Yeah, that's not something that you would think about when you I think about water conservation yeah. uh, in, in that process. Yeah. So, I mean, what are some other challenges that, say, specifically in the city of Houston um, that you're working on or that, I mean, you talked a little bit about how many miles of pipe and maintaining all of that, but what, you know, there's a lot of growth in Texas and in, in Houston specifically, so what kind of challenges do you yes, face? Yes, so I would uh, group the, the main challenges for, for us is, one is absolutely population growth. Um, it's not necessarily a challenge, it's something that you have to account for, right? Mm -hmm. So we know that in the city of Houston, we're gonna have a 50% a population growth in the next 40, 50 years. Some ad adjacent counties are experiencing even higher growth, for example, North Fort Bend, for Bend and County, as long uh, as well as uh, Montgomery County, they are experiencing a hundred percent growth. They will be experiencing a hundred percent growth in the next 40, 50 years. So, because the city produces water for its residential customers within the city limits, but also provides uh, water to wholesale customers mm -hmm. that are in those counties, you know, we also have to take into account that 
of their respect, you know, pop respective population growth increases. So that's that's one side of the puzzle, the projected demand growth. Um, so we very much have to plan for that. And the the other cha challenge that we have is the aging infrastructure, as we, you know, and this is not a specific to Houston, but it's really, a sp you know, uh, really is 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 everywhere mm -hmm. in the U.S. Uh, a lot of utilities are dealing with this, and um, you know, s utilities have been historically disinvested, um, you know, in you know to to rehab or replace uh, their water pipes, their water systems. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and luckily, well, we talk about later maybe s about the solutions, but uh, you know, we have a good solution with the infrastructure bill that was passed last year. So, that but anyways, that that's one of the main challenges. The uh, the, I the aging infrastructure, you know, in the city we have high levels of water loss, which is even higher now during the drought because the pipes are pipes are, um, are breaking. Yep. Yeah, yeah, the soil is shifting, yep. it's, it's compacting, and it's shifting, it's causing, you know, an increase in, in the breaks. So it's exacerbating a problem that was already there. Yep. So... Um, it doesn't make things easier. So, and then the other, the, the third component uh, or variable of, of the challenges is climate change. Because as we all know, you know, climate change, what it's doing is exacerbating the climate that we already have. And here in Houston, we, we have extreme climate. We, have, we can have, you know, heavy rains and that can cause something like Harvey, which is an, was an absolute extreme event mm -hmm. but then it can cause a yuri that you know just like we experienced uh, last year and so those extremes um, are going to continue and we're going to continue seeing those and then so how do you prepare for that right how would you prepare to these unforeseen extremes and um, yeah and climate change can have an impact on exacerbating both drought and flooding but also can have an impact on your infrastructure as well mm -hmm. and so um Luckily, we are we are planning for this. We have a great resilient Houston plan out there um, that we produced last year, as well as a climate action plan. So mm -hmm. we are very much underway with with great planning and adaptation tools and, and resilient tools, and and we're also going to. Um, to develop a one water master plan that I can talk about okay. it later uh, and, and that's a massive undertaking and we're very, very excited about and uh, will shape, will transform how we, how we do, how we provide and produce water and how we uh, make sure that we leverage our uh, planning and our um, uh, infrastructure building in a, in a more holistic and more resilient way, uh, taking into account, you know, stormwater and, and also wastewater. So mm. not just working in silos within the right. utility, and because right now we are a bit siloed. So integrating all of that and then w building smart, gotcha. right? And leveraging our resources and opportunities and, and also building more, you know, things that are good for the community, like amenities, Right, so you're building a plan, but can you build a com you know something for the community that has, a, you know, an additional, you know, um, that will serve the community mm -hmm. in some way, right? Sure. It could be a green space, a nature-based solution. So, and of course, we want the community to be involved in that process. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the first phase that we are going to be starting in 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 January will will take a year and it will be all about community engagement and stakeholder engagement because we very much want to hear from the community uh, before we shape this plan. We want to shape it with their voices, very cool. essentially. So, yeah. yeah. No, that's interesting. And, you know, you mentioned the, uh, like when we have this drought and it causes issues with soil and the pipes are breaking. I mean, we yeah. see the impact of that too in the commercial buildings and that you have lower pressure going to these buildings than normal. And so, you know, now we're getting calls to add pressure boosting systems where maybe they weren't needed before, things like that. Yeah. URI obviously caused all kinds of different right. <laughs> yes. problems yes. that I don't know that anybody right. in Houston, Texas w was prepared for. Um, so we've definitely seen the impact of some of this stuff carry over from kind of the distribution and, and uh, municipal side into the buildings. And obviously, I think everybody felt some of that um, in their houses yes. as well. So, yes, yes. you know, y you've, you've talked a little bit about some of the solutions and, and things that you're working on uh, that are coming up. Where can people go find more information if they want to get involved or, or 
you know, play a part in that in that study? Yes. Yeah, so uh, as we uh, so right now we are uh, you know in the process of procurement with our first phase, and once the consultant is awarded, uh, the consultant is going to develop a number of tools, website, uh, you know, and it's going to be reaching out uh, to the community to have different different ways of engagement. Could be virtual meetings, could be meetings at city hall, could be a variety of ways, okay. and so. Um, we're hoping that the, we, the community doesn't have to come to us and the, through these tools, we can go to the community and cool. let them know. But if anything, uh, beginning January, we should, we, you know, the community can reach out to us and, and look for, you know, Houston Water, One Water Master Plan. And um, hopefully they'll, they'll find information yeah. about that and, and they, will, they, they can be engaged. Very so, cool. Mm -hmm. No, that sounds great. And, you know, I think ultimately, what we want to talk about today is something that we're all kind of working on and, and uh, passionate about, and that's this the Walk for Water event yes. that's coming up in October. And that is to raise awareness for the water crisis. And we've talked a lot about today that we're fortunate to be able to go to the tap and turn on and get nice, clean water. But that's not the case for a large amount of people across the globe. So, uh, Jonathan, can you expand a little bit on the, the Walk for Water event and kind of what's going on to, to drive the reason for the event yeah i think uh, you know what what the walk for water event is really tied to to the water missions organization mm -hmm. out in uh, the carolinas but it really talks to the grundfoss organization grundfoss values and of course our purpose and y you know the the reality as you said there are, are millions of people are 2.2 2 yeah. 2 billion people sorry not millions 2.2 .2 billion people that actually uh, don't have the privilege of of being able to go to a faucet and open and and there's water. So it's something that's been in in the Grundfos DNA for from the beginning, mm -hmm. uh, from the moment we made our first pump for a farmer. Uh, we more than 75 years ago, our, our ambition is to bring water to to places where there's not enough water, and of course uh, to help to mo move water away where, where there is too much water. And we spoke about the changing uh, climate challenges. So uh, Water Missions is one of the organizations that we as Grundfos and our foundation actually support globally mm -hmm. uh, to help address some of the water challenges. Uh, and some of those water challenges are, are, are new. For example, uh, our, um, people in Ukraine uh, entering into, into Europe. Uh, we forget that these people are arriving and they need water and water missions are certainly there helping and, and our foundation has helped to support uh, um, the, the establishment of infrastructure to, to bring water to those people. In the United States, uh, we've been walking, this will be our 12th walk, 12th year of walking uh, for, for raising funds for, for water missions who are a Christian-based engineering firm. Uh, and I think that engineering firm is a key thing because we work with a lot of NGOs, churches, uh, a lot of global uh, organizations uh, that are working to bring water to, to communities around the, the world. Wa we choose water missions amongst others for our walk for water because they do a very, very high quality professional job. And I think the, the key thing is we all have it in our heart. We want to go and help a community, but you need to engage with the community first, understand mm -hmm. what their needs are. We, we, we've worked on many infrastructure projects in, in South America, Central America, Africa, uh, in Asia, where there's great intentions, uh, infrastructure's put in, but there's no uh, system or process sure. being put into place to make sure it's maintained. And, and, and that's where uh, our partnership with Water Missions actually start. This will be our third physical walk for Grundfos in the city of Houston. Mm -hmm. We started our first walk in 2017, and it was a small walk. And uh, I remember when we did that first walk, I think you were there with your son. And uh, I, I said to one of the organizing committee, the, the ambition must be we've got to get the city of Houston involved, and we've got to make this a big, bigger thing uh, in, in the city. Yep. And with our opening of our new global headquarters, so our global water utility headquarters are now in the city of Houston, so we moved that from Denmark to the city. We have even a, a higher reason or a higher impetus to actually make this a major walk. Yep. So of course we'll hopefully be in the hundreds, and uh, um, in the future we'll be maybe in the hundreds of thousands of walkers in the city of Houston to to help raise funds for for this very important cause. Yep. Uh, you know, 
until you've seen a community without water. And I think we, as I said, we take for granted, like, you know, if there's no water in the tap for a couple of hours or a day, we're like, man, there are utilities. But if you see a community that has no water, you actually see a community which, there's an unfortunate terminology, what they call base of pyramid, which is Maslow's mm -hmm. hierarchy of needs. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's unbelievable the change that you can bring on a community just by bringing them bringing that community water, mm -hmm. that you can transform lives. It means people can focus on education. They can focus on family. Uh, they can focus on improving their quality of life as opposed to focusing on where's the next drop of water going to come that I'm going to drink. Right. And it's probably not good water to drink in the first place, right? I mean, they're, they're – and what we're emulating in this walk is what so many people do every day, and that's, like you said, spend hours a day walking – to the nearest water source, getting water and then carrying it back to be used without any sort of kind of filtration or treatment or anything like that. And so, like you said, leads to, uh, you know, disease and a lot of other things, not just the time investment to be able to do that. So a lot of issues coming out of the lack of access to water, for sure. A absolutely. I mean, like health and education. And wh what you try to emulate with a walk is a five mile walk. Mm -hmm. And so it's not too far, <laughs> but it's uh, on average the, the, the kind of distance one, one would have a community member has to walk every single day, maybe with an old bucket. Uh, and uh, we try to g give walkers the, the sensation of, of having to walk to a water point, collect the water and, and bring, it, bring it home. And as you quite rightly say, uh, in many cases that water is still not in a drinkable condition. Uh, it's uh, carry, uh, carrying some waterborne diseases. That water has to be boiled. Uh, so at the end of the day, that bucket of water is not uh, the same volume of water that, that right. the individual that brought uh, uh, the water to their home. It's, it's now a little bit less, and then they have to cook, wash, drink, whatever it might be. So. Yeah, but it's and I have done the walk a couple of times, and it's great. I'm really excited to be able to go back and do it with the whole group, and not uh, the quote unquote virtual walk that we've done uh, for for a couple of years. Um, but last year we did a virtual walk, me and my family, around. So this will be our second time to do Buffalo Bayou. Um, now that it's going to be downtown Buffalo Bayou, we did Terry Hershey Park, and so it was really interesting because we had buckets and we kind of took off on a little path and uh, you know stopped halfway at the by you and dipped our buckets in and then kept going around and I have an eight-year-old and a three-year-old and it, you know it got some attention from people that were just generally in the park you know we looked odd carrying around a <laughs> bunch of buckets <laughs> you know uh, people are running and jogging riding bikes and stuff and so a couple people would ask and kind of look at us like what are y'all doing and one one lady was like are y'all catching turtles <laughs> and I was like oh man and I hear my you know my eight-year-old my three-year-old like, oh turtles we, we're catching turtles I'm like no we're not catching turtles <laughs> 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 you know, so they convince them, no, we're not, no turtles right now. So, uh, but it was, you know, once we got around and, and, you know, they were asking a lot of questions. And so we're talking about a lot of the things that, that uh, I'm sure will be shared at this event about why we're doing it, what's the impact. And once we got to water, I mean, I think my son's bucket was basically empty by the time we got back. He was like, <laughs> kept dumping it into ours or dumping it out, but it gets really heavy, right? I mean, you don't think about even a five, you know, five gallon bucket of water is going to be what? over 40 pounds i mean that carrying that for a couple of miles really uh we worked up a sweat for sure uh by the end and it was it was a lot of fun and many of us have actually been at the ground floor office and actually experienced what it is to actually lift mm -hmm. the real bucket and many of us have not been able to lift it right which could you imagine on it on a, i believe it's three miles that people have to walk on average in, in those countries that we're, we're talking about. Um, and we are doing, uh, you know, our walk is going to be a, a, a much smaller scale in terms of weight yes. that we have to carry, but it's a representation of what that walk signifies every day for people that they have to go and get the water and, and they have to get it in this jug that is how many gallons exactly? Jonathan? I'm trying to think now. Is it 20 gallons? Eh? The it's yeah. I mean, liters, it's remember? It's yeah, pretty big. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's liters. Yeah. <laughs> nice. It's and a lot. Yeah. It's, it's definitely a lot. lot. It's, a, it's, it's a jerry can so of yeah. water. You yeah. have to think, sorry, too, that, that if, if you were g going to walk three, four, f five miles, uh, you, you're not going to carry a little garden bucket right. that we do. You're going to carry a, a, a jerry yeah. can. 
you're going to fill it up and then you're going to care because you're going to try and do it do it once but if you if you think how much the average human or the average family needs in terms of of water and how many of those cans you need to actually uh, to to have to survive mm -hmm. it's not just one right uh, and and i think that that's the part that we, which we're trying to get that message across and that uh, that there's we can do something we can all do something little thing it's a tiny little thing uh, we can we can talk about some of the challenges that that are in the world and uh, we can bemoan some of the challenges that we face in our, our first world challenges mm -hmm. But in actual fact, we can do the smallest little thing, and uh, and uh, and the smallest little thing is to actually get your family together, grab a bucket, and go for a walk on a nice uh, uh, Saturday morning around the bayou. Yep. And that that little effort translates into a massive impact uh, for a community where a solar-powered borehole pump can be installed, the water quality can be tested, that. Uh, we can just improve the quality of life for, for a community just that much mm -hmm. more and just take that just take them to the next level without having to um have long dialogues and conversations and uh, and uh, discussions about uh, some of these true realities that that are that people face in the world today mm -hmm. and that was yeah i'm glad you brought that up i mean that was basically what i was going to kind of go to next was you know we're doing the walk. Obviously, that's raising awareness, and we're talking about it. But ultimately, we're raising money for the organization, and that's that's ultimately what they do: is go into these communities, get well pumps installed, solar well pumps that can be self-sufficient, and then what you do at the end of the walk is pretty cool: is dump that water into a trough, and then it goes through uh, kind of that treatment process. And on the other side, you have uh, clean water that's coming out. So very cool to kind of see the process happen at the walk, but ultimately that's what's happening in, in these communities with the funds that are raised. Correct. That's, that's right. I think that, you know, a and I've been privileged enough to, to, to see many uh, boreholes being installed in really strange places uh, on the planet. And there is a sense that uh, you, you literally can go anywhere as long it depends how far you, uh, how far you need to drill but there's water uh, in Texas maybe you've come across <laughs> <laughs> some, you just some need a oil. shovel <laughs> you just need a shovel yeah I mean you could hit oil um, too but so so, so, so so the first thing is that in in many cases the water is actually there and we, we can we, we have a way to extract that water in some cases not all cases that water quality is actually or immediately potable. In other words, mm -hmm. you can drink it. A and that's why the, the, the need to have a professional engineering uh, complete these projects because, and, and I don't want to take away from uh, communities that uh, uh, um, uh, take initiatives to go and help a c another community and, and put a borehole in. But sometimes that water quality is not that great, and you have you've kind of done an injustice. And that's what this walk is about: is 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 actually doing the, the doing it really well and doing it professionally and doing it properly. So you're right. Th there's a, a certainly a, a borehole will be installed, uh, or if we raise a lot of money, a lot of boreholes, <laughs> which is really cool. And uh, then of course, uh, water missions have developed a water treatment plant, a mobile mm -hmm. water treatment plant, or it can be a, a, a standalone water treatment plant that will be installed at the at the at the borehole if the water quality is not up to standard. And uh, again, as I said, the engagement with the local community is super important to make sure that the equipment is maintained mm -hmm. and uh, uh, the, the the community can enjoy uh, quality water for 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 the next hundred years. And so there's those three or four elements that, that uh, um, we're, we're trying to demonstrate, as sure. you say, in, in the walk. Um, and water missions know, know how to do it really well with, of course, in partnership with, with our Grundfos engineers, mm -hmm. which are very ex fortunate. We have some really super clever people. Yes. <laughs> Awesome. So, no, and what I want, I want to add to that is that you know the beauty of all this water walk is like a, it's a win-win mm -hmm. for the city and for the community of the city because from the city standpoint, we, what we want to do is is make sure people understand the value of the water, right? Absolutely. And so sometimes it's very hard to understand that conceptually until you have to do something like this walk and you physically have to take water walk and, and, and of course we're educating at the same time of the why we're doing this mm -hmm. right so that that kids can understand that hey you know 
this is what happens in other countries. You know, people have to go to to a body of water to get you know and transport that water to for their for their consumption. And then we can get to help through the water mission, we get to help those communities mm -hmm. in need. So we're educating and helping. I think you cannot there's you know, is you cannot find a better purpose of that. So um so that's why and, and I think leveraging, you know, Grandfoss audience that they have done in the past, which is super helpful because they have the expertise, they have done this in the past and now try, trying it to take it to the next level through the city and with a little bit more reach, trying to engage all the community at large, those uh, bis the business mm -hmm. community as well, uh, commercial, you name it. Everybody would that would like to participate, they can join, they can create a team and, and we can all walk together and 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 in support this great mission, right? Absolutely. So yeah, I think that I must add, you know, that the conversation is is a much broader conversation. It's a real conversation, even in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, this conservation of wa of water, we know it. It's a real challenge. Uh, there's a, a wonderful major infrastructure project that, that that's happening here in the city to bring water. You can see the big pipelines yep. down from the. There's a message in those pipelines that without that kind of infrastructure there is no there's no water for some communities in the city of Houston. And I think the the the, the we're demonstrating not a I think what it is like to not have water, but there's another message for people that do have water and that's the water conservation message. Uh, yeah. We really need to to look at this resource as not the infinite resource mm -hmm. which we believe that it is. We look at the oceans and we look at the lakes and it's fantastic it's just water f everywhere quality water is going to I is not going to it is a a, a, a rare resource in mm -hmm. some states in the united states mm -hmm. yes so you know the the reality is we can talk about communities in africa or in in central america and, and we can feel pity for those people but there are communities in the united states that are, are facing challenges uh, from and it's environmental and and it's 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 conservation of water and so there's a message that we we do want to get across it, uh, from a Grundfos perspective we talk about leak uh, uh, loss of water or right. at least for the utilities what we call non-revenue water mm -hmm. but non-revenue water is means that that wasn't measured it was lost and right. you know some cities lose 50 percent of their water around the world uh, the challenge uh, in Denmark uh, actually has, has worked to, to get that down to below 10, 8%, wow. 4% acceptable. But many of the cities losing 10, 15% in the United States through leak. Mm -hmm. And so that so for Grundfos, we really try to focus working with the utilities on that. How do we manage uh, uh, water loss, that precious resource, and it's treated water. Right. And that treated water, treated water, when it comes to your faucet, has come with a lot of energy. Absolutely, and so the other dimension is for us to 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 really work continuously to to find ways to bring water to people at the lowest energy point, mm -hmm. because the more demand, the bigger the pipes, the more water, the more energy consumed to bring that water. If you if you see the equipment that is being installed uh, to bring the water from the city of Houston, it's from an engineering perspective, it's a marvel, and we love right. it. it. You know, we could sit as engineers forever looking at this <laughs> at wonderful machines, but the reality is there's a lot of energy that goes into uh, moving that water and treating the water, and and so these are the two dimensions that that we're focusing on. And within this walk, it's part of the message that that, that we want to get across for people that do have water. There is a need for us to 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 start conserving this resource that is not just a a, a boundless limited resource. Mm -hmm. and it it yeah. goes hand in hand with, I mean, you hear a lot about net zero carbon and the ESG policies and all of that that's happening. And a lot of the focus is on energy, but you can't have that conversation without talking about water conservation as well. I mean, they're so closely tied together, like we talked about earlier, that absolutely, you know, you're going to have to reduce your water consumption, you know, in order to reduce your, reduce your energy consumption. Yeah, and I was going to add that, you know, conservation here in Houston, you know, is, is, is a tough conversation to, to have because, you know, there's a perception that we are war abundant, right? It rains the majority, a lot <laughs> of the time, right? We have 50%, 50 inches of rain on average per year. So there is, the, it's not an illusion. We are, we have good rainfall, but what happens is, and, and that going back to the, the conversation of where we get the water from, right? Mm -hmm. We have these three lakes, but also, you have your the number of plants that 
that treat a certain capacity per day. And beyond that, you have to expand. If you, ha if you want additional capacity right. per day, you have to expand. And then you have to start thinking, oh, okay, but if I expand, First of all, I have to use it, my water rights, right? You exercise those water rights. And then you have to be always careful of like, okay, am I leaving enough water in the rivers? Because that, that, you know, we have to really think holistically here. Mm -hmm. It's not just, uh, you know, let's just use the water because we have it, right? But we also have to be mindful of what are we leaving for our wildlife, right? Mm -hmm. And um, and I think it's you know the environmental component is is very important and the city has you know we support that very much and we through the one water that's we want to make sure that we are uh, looking at each of these stakeholder sectors so that we are can be respectful of of each of those areas and work together for a common mm -hmm. you know goal. Um, but also in the city of Houston, so it rains, right? And people ask me, okay, but that rain goes to the aquifers. And, and yes, but I explain that it takes hundreds of years for that water to make it to the aquifers that we have here in, in the Gulf Coast. And even when it does, we have restrictions because right. we've pumped so much groundwater for the last decades that what happened in Houston is this, the, this so the, the, the ground subsided. So we see subsidence in many areas which exacerbate flooding, right? So I know this is a big, big topic, but the reality is that now we have limitations as, fa as, as, as far as how much water we can take from groundwater resources. Sure. And that goes back, it goes back to that our tap water right now is 13%. The tap, the, the water that we get from the tap is 13% ground right. groundwater and 87 surface water. So then we're going into surface water. Okay, now we have the lakes. In the future, we're gonna, we, you know, for Houston, it, it's gonna be, okay, what is, what is next in the portfolio? Reuse. People ask mm -hmm. me about desalination. Yes, resalination is great, but you have to remember that it costs 10, 11 times more Very expensive. than your water. And the cheapest water that you'll ever have is the, comp the, co the water that you don't use. So <laughs> that is how we are going to get into mm -hmm. the next decades. In fact, at the regional level, there is, a, there is a region, our region for Houston and the 14 counties that surround the Harris County is called Region H, ground okay. planning group. And uh, we know that in 40, 50 years, at least a minimum of 10% of the water that we get in that future will have to come from conservation. Therefore, we will not have sufficient water. As a Texas of as a whole, 45% of the water in Texas will have to come from conservation and reuse. So that gives you an idea of the magnitude. Sure. And I know this is an abstract concept. Okay, how do you get water from conservation? <laughs> do I have to start hoarding the water like now and put it in the bathtub and save it for 20 years? It doesn't work like that. It works. It's all in the behavior. Mm -hmm. If I conserve today and then my appliances get more efficient over time, and then by the time, uh, you know, in, in 20 years or 30 years when my kids, my grandkids, they will have that mindset as well, and everybody will be doing enough conservation that we will be able to right. reach our goals. And that's, you know, it's a, a mirror image of what is happening with the, the power grid, right? You're saying yes. it's, it's, it is easier cheaper to reduce our energy yes. consumption than it is to add more generation. Exactly. Right. And same goes for the kind of distributed power production or kind of on-site production and storage of power. Same thing applies to the capture and reuse of water. Right. Yes. And so, I mean, we, we're starting to partner with um, a, a company to be able to take, you know, rainwater, stormwater, condensate, those sort of things on-site, do exactly. some, you know, a little bit of uh, filtration, things like that, depending on what the, if it's for irrigation, cooling tower makeup or uh, gray water type applications and be able to reuse that water locally on site. And I'll, you know, that kind of ties back to the green stormwater initiatives that the city of Houston is working on to kind of slow that amount that's going into the, the storm uh, system, reduce flooding, things like that. So, I mean, I, I think absolutely when people are thinking about on-site storage generation of power, that they should also be thinking about the same thing for water. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, there's always a trade-off. Yes, we can get more water. Yes, we can do the salination, but that's going to increase our rates, right? Mm -hmm. And it's going to, we have to think about the environment again, because what happens with desalination? What is the byproduct of desalination? 
yes. it's brine. Exactly, and yes, brine. that's a toxic component. So, you know, of course, then you have to know how to discharge it, right? Mm -hmm. And so offshore, in the ocean, you can cause another problem. So you have to be very, very careful about these things. Uh, everything is in, in on the table when we think about the, all these strategies, and that's I think what why the One Water that the plan that mm -hmm. that the city will put together that is 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 what we're trying to do in a very smart way. Yep, taking the voice of the community, what the community envisions, and then bringing the the community of the engineers to bring those smart solutions for what we're trying to do. Because whatever happens in the future, it has to be a smart and resilient. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think, you know, w we could be sitting here uh, having a doomsday environmental, <laughs> and, and there, there is a lot of uh, individuals around the world that, that, that spend a lot of time telling us that it's the end of the world. And uh, if, you, if you went to some of the United Nations meetings, you'll hear the truth, and it doesn't look really good. So we can spend time discussing, or we can actually spend a lot of time saying what are we going to do about it and what are we doing. And I, and I think the, the aquifer story in, in the city of Houston is a great example of what we can learn. There's nothing wrong. It's very important. There's nothing wrong with extracting the water from the aquifer. What is wrong is if you over-extract, so you don't mm. give the nature an opportunity to replenish this natural resource. So it's it the, the, the pumping of water out of the aquifer as a lesson is not wrong, is we didn't manage it. Mm -hmm. We didn't manage that, th that resource well, and then now we live with the consequences of, of uh, uh, sinkholes and, and uh, uh, aquifers that are now, uh, or at least water that has a lot, of a lot more salt in it. Right. The same will happen if you do desalinization. A lot of energy, but if we just uh, extract and we put that brine back in the ocean, it has an impact. Mm -hmm. So it's all about the balance. And I, and I think that's the conservation conversation that we have to have in a community. We have to, as you take your children around, we have to make sure our children are learning these new behaviors that, that as a community, this, this resource is not limited. It is there. Mm -hmm. can be used responsibly, and it can be put back into the water cycle, and it can be reused uh, used again. We just have to get that paradigm shift for people to realize that. And, uh, and, and of course, it's a real tricky one because the, 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 the amazing, it's I think it's a $1.7 billion investment the city of Houston has for the, for the water treatment plant that's going to bring water from, the, from uh, uh, Lake Houston. It's phenomenal. Wow. As I said, from an engineering thing, it was, it's like a, I was like a kid in a candy box. <laughs> It's just gonna, it's going to bring water, but people need to realize that that's a limited resource. Let's get a culture yep. of conservation of actually how do we use our water for irrigation. Uh, it rains. What's amazing about the city of Houston is where, where the country I come from, uh, city of Cape Town, uh, had a four day, uh, four week. It was four weeks or four day point where there was going to be no water. Yeah. The city I grew up in, is, is in Port Elizabeth, has 14 days. They're on a 14-day level of water. They've put the standpipes, they've built the areas for the community. When they shut off the homes, they've said you can go to the standpipe area with your bucket and collect water. Oh, wow. This is not people living in rural Africa. This is first world Africa. It's as first world as, as Houston. There's a conservation conversation we actually have. There's no rainwater tanks. We talk about rainwater, but wh why aren't we collecting rainwater in our of our big roofs here in mm -hmm. Houston and using that for irrigation? Absolutely. You know, uh, there's just those kind of basic kind of things that we need to for an expanding uh, communities like Houston. There's lots of conversation about uh, people migrating from other states to the great state of, of Texas, mm -hmm. they're coming. And, they're, and, and we can talk about that proudly as from a Texas perspective, but we're going to need to give make sure there's water. Sure. And if we can get in a culture of just starting to conserve and manage our water a lot better, we are able to expand the life of, the, of, the, of that resource in the community. Sure. The sinkhole story in Houston is the lesson that we can learn from. It's not the story of like, ah, oh, look, the sinkhole sank. It's the end of the world. Your car's going to fall into it. That's not, that's not the story. That's not the message. The message is if we manage that natural resource, it could be there forever. Right. And I think it's, y you know, kind of a way to sum that up is just saying we want to leave things better than we found them. Yeah. And kind of that idea or mentality of saying I didn't inherit this from my parents. I'm borrowing it from my from my children and my grandchildren, right? So I think that's that, that mentality that you're talking about and, and that kind of future outlook of conservation. So, yeah. 
what so if people are you know hopefully jazzed up about uh, this topic that we've been talking about, you know, maybe uh, raise a little bit of awareness today and want to come out and walk. Maybe we can talk a little bit about the actual walk itself. Uh, I mean, we're going to share some of the details specifically about how to register, how to do a team, how to, you know, uh, donate or, or raise some money. But where is the walk this year and, you know, how can people get involved? Well, I'm going to talk about the walk. You can talk about the venue because in partnership with the city, we, we've moved the venue to mm -hmm. a, a great venue. Uh, uh, and uh, it allows us to to grow the walk uh, in the in the future. To get involved in the walk, really, really easy. Uh, uh, you're going to be posting a link uh, mm -hmm. where people can join. It's it's, it's not a major thing. This uh, the money that we raise goes straight to water missions, straight to the to the community. So it's not going to Grundfos or the city. Uh, you go onto the website, uh, join the Grundfos uh, uh, Houston Walk for Water on the link. Uh, you can either join one of the teams. You can join my team, which is the water utility <laughs> team. But if uh, and I know you're in yes, <laughs> you're the, team. yes the, the commercial <laughs> building team. The, the link might be to our team. Be to your team, <laughs> or you. Uh, I think we're encouraging uh, communities, companies, make your own team. Yes, make it a company event. It costs actually. It's going to cost uh, for a company event. It costs nothing if you think about it. Uh, register your team. Uh, and uh, the instructions is pretty intuitive on, on, the, on, the, on the website, on the link. And, uh, you know, come and join us uh, with your families. Come and have a walk. Uh, bring your picnics mm -hmm. uh, and enjoy the, the, the morning. So it's a really easy activity to participate in. It doesn't cost you anything. Uh, it just costs you a little bit of time. Absolutely. So where, uh, where are we walking this year? The venue is in yeah. Allen's Landing. It will start in Allen's Landing. And, um, well, we have a, a trail. Uh, it would be nice to have a map here, but we don't We don't have it. It's in the, in, it's in the website. But, um, you know, locally is uh, right next to the Buffalo Bayou Preservation mm -hmm. Building. So uh, it's going to be 1.5 miles to a body of water where you will get the water, you'll get the bucket, you'll get uh, a t-shirt uh, and other goodies at the beginning, and then you will walk to this destination, a bottle of water, and then you'll come back with what that water. So uh, that's the venue, Alice Allen's Landing, and uh, we need the date. It's October 29th. Perfect. At uh, Allen's Landing downtown. So uh, if you're familiar with the city of Houston, kind of that northwest corner of downtown right there on the bayou. And it's going to be really cool to do this, you know, the backdrop of downtown and uh you know, dipping into Buffalo Bayou, I yes. think that's, you know, kind of iconic for everybody in Houston. So uh, we, we did this on a smaller scale last year, like I said, with my family. And, um, you know, you get up close to the Buffalo Bayou and you're like, wow, I'm so glad this is not what I'm having to drink and bathe and brush my teeth. <laughs> 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 you know, you're like, it, once you get in the bucket, you're like, okay, it's maybe not so bad. But, um, you know, so it's a little, little humbling experience to do that, especially if you're uh, feeling you know, macho and fill your bucket up all the way, you're probably going to regret that uh, pretty quickly <laughs> on, the, on, the, on, the, on the walk back. Um, so they uh, don't drink the water you, in the bucket. You, you can always tell, like, who, who are the kind of the first time walkers with how much they fill up their bucket. I'm like, well, I don't know if you're going to make it all the way back with that. <laughs> yes, and you cannot cheat, right? Yes. <laughs> it, 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 some people even go two buckets because they're like, you know, it just kind of the weight offsets a little bit. So yeah, yeah, I'm, not, I'm normally the two buckets because my wife is scooping one of those big buckets and she's walking. Uh, uh, a few meters and then going well yes back here's, here's the right, right. yes i yes. have i have heard the stories about people who are going to try to put it in their backpacks, backpacks. too oh, like okay. try to fill a maybe that's not going to be a bucket it's probably going to be some sort some of plastic bottle thing. that has a lead That'd and be interesting. Maybe know, they're, they're trying to get you know creative yes. around these because uh, again it all comes back uh, to the fact that it's not easy right to carry that water. Right. You can't pull a wagon and stick the bucket in there. That's no. cheating. So, <laughs> so, I mean, my dream is to, to have thousands of people on this walk. Yeah. One day. Yeah. Really cool. yeah. And uh, so, so now that I think about it, because we were, we were chatting with the, the Houston team this morning, and uh, they we were trying to estimate how many people are going to walk, and I've got to make the allocations. Uh, and and you know me well enough. Uh, it's <laughs> we we don't aim low. Uh, we aim as high as possible. Yep. And uh, I'm hoping that actually we'll have to put an announcement out that people should bring their own buckets. Yep. Because we haven't catered okay. enough buckets. I, th I think right. the city of Houston just needs to come together. Uh, and and as I said, companies uh, make it a fun thing to do. You know, it's it's going to be. This is the start of something amazing. Uh, 
So you might as well be uh, first the, the first group because uh, in 10 years' time, you'll look back and go, I was there yep. at the first uh, city of Houston uh, uh, walk for water and uh, look how amazingly big it is. So. Awesome. Yeah, and I think it's going to be uh, fantastic to get every to see everybody, right? Uh, it's just it's going to be very um, uh, to me, especially coming from the conservation, you know, field. You know, even when I know that even when I'm doing that walk, when I will be doing that walk, I know it's going to be an emotional moment because no matter how much you know about this, right, and how much you believe with this, the moment of doing and acting on something like this. Is very meaningful, and everybody coming together has a tremendous meaning to it. Absolutely. So um, we all want to be part of that, and we encourage everybody to to jump on that wagon and join us and and, and experience this uh, moment. That I think for Houston, you know, first is the first time at the city level that we're doing this, and then we are hoping that this will be an ongoing event that we can. Uh, repeat every year. So awesome. we want to thank you for this opportunity to yes, share this. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. I want to thank you all for coming on the show. Paula, Jonathan had a great time. Uh, you know, I think we covered a lot today, but uh, I kind of the theme all the way through ties back to the water conservation and the, the why behind the Walk for Water, trying to you know do our small part here to leave it better than we found it and, and help out with the, the global water crisis. So uh, any any final thoughts from, from either of y'all on anything that we've talked about today? Uh, like I said, I know we kind of touched on quite a bit, but is there any, any final shout outs for the event or, you know, resources at the city of Houston or anything with Grump Yeah, Foss, please well, well, first of all, you know, just I, I want to again invite the community at large. Uh, everyone is invited. You can bring your family, your neighbors, your friends, and it can be a really, really fun event. Um, it is uh, donation based. Mm -hmm. So we have, I believe it's a minimum, right? And then beyond that, you can fundraise or, or, or donate whatever you would like. So um, again, we encourage you to be, to be there on the 29th. And on this conservation standpoint, the only thing that I would like to mm -hmm. you know, mention is in going back to this um, groundwater, and I know this is technical, but <laughs> you know, once we, you know, once we have that, um, sinking of the ground, right? Uh, that subsidence. People sometimes will tell me, okay, can can that be fixed? Can we replenish that that and put it back? And mm. what happens, Jonathan? It cannot be fixed. Yeah, it's, it's, it's irreversible, it's right? It's that many environmental impacts. Yeah. You, you can sometimes make an improvement to yes. the river, but yes. you, if you've killed everything that's in yeah. the river, it's dead forever. Yeah. You never, it'll take thousands of years to... to uh, I have never seen a sinkhole coming up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. imagine maybe if uh, I'm not yeah. sure how is that happening, but the answer is no. I yeah. think uh, once you've overpumped, you've overpumped. Uh, yeah. you, the, the probability of you uh, of it replenishing itself is is it's 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 lost. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Yeah. I think that's and I guess I wanted to add that at the very end. I think because I this is also an opportunity for us to educate. Mm -hmm. Right, is is talking about the water walk for water, which is an event where we want to fundraise and do many things and raise the awareness of the value of water. But at the same time, we want to educate about you know why conservation, so that people can make an informed decision. And if somebody else says, "Oh, we don't need to conserve," well, oh yes, and and I will tell you why. And so, giving you the information is you enable enable you everyone mm -hmm. to make an informed decision when it comes to this. Absolutely. Well, again, thank you all for coming on uh, the podcast today. Really enjoyed the conversation. Definitely looking forward to uh, the Walk for Water and definitely see both of you all there. Yeah, and thanks for the, the opportunity to uh, yeah. to come on Building Value. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for yes, having us. Absolutely. We really appreciate this. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Also want to thank all of you for watching and listening today on this episode of Building Value and hope to see you on the next one.